We're at the Walker Arts Center for a dialogue with Steve McQueen. Tonight's program is titled Steve McQueen, Art and Cinema. We'll talk about his remarkable career as both an artist and a filmmaker. Steve McQueen began his career as a visual artist. In 1999, he was awarded the prestigious Turner Prize, Britain's highest honor for the visual arts. At that moment, he was part of a new generation of artists who were really forging a new kind of video installation, pushing filmmaking out of the cinema and into the gallery. Many of the projects he did at the time were multiple screen video installations or projections in which one became very aware of the reflections on the floor or the space around the screen. So the viewer became much more mobile, not seated in a stationary seat in the cinema as I am now, but really mobilized so that they would move from screen to screen and become a much more active participant in the, in the experience of cinema. Subsequently, he actually reversed tack and returned to feature filmmaking, uh, beginning with his feature film, Hunger, about Bobby Sands and the IRA uh, prison strikes in the Mays prison uh, during the early 1980s. This won him wide acclaim and also really highlighted his interest in the body, uh, in particular the brutal uh, punishment to which the prisoners at the time were submitted. He continued this interest um, also working with the actor Michael Fassbender, who also appeared in Hunger, in Shame, a film about a sex addict in 1990s New York City. Subsequently, this year, he's now come out with his widely acclaimed feature film, Twelve Years a Slave, about a history of slavery in North America based on the life story of Samuel Northrup and his memoirs. This film is also one that continues to shock people and I think really realizes Steve's ambition to show the unknown, show repressed histories, really reveal things that are invisible within our society in a very direct and physical way. His cinema is one in which the body has a very central role, in which sound um, and sensation are as important as the visual image, so that it becomes a very sensorial and physical experience. Tonight we'll be discussing many of these ideas in his work and how he's really moved fluidly between the cinema and the gallery. I'm Stuart Comer, Chief Curator for Media and Performance Art at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and now let's go to our dialogue with Steve McQueen. Good evening, and thanks very much to Cheryl and Dean and Olga and the staff at the Walker for bringing us here. It's a huge honor for me to be here with Steve in a room which is very rare in museums like this. Um, for most art museums, to take cinema seriously is a very rare thing, and to have a cinema as exceptional as this one is a very exciting thing. And to be in the company of an artist like this who has really demanded that we take both the gallery and the cinema much more seriously, and the connection between the two has become much more interesting in the years that he's been producing the incredible work that he has. So I hope we can really get into some of the ideas um, that happen on screen in Steve's work, but also talk a bit about the spaces in which those screens are situated and what that means to all of us, both physically, architecturally, politically. Um, it's a very complicated recipe that Steve's presented us with, um, and it's really um, great to be here with him to draw this out a bit. Um, from his earliest work in the early 1990s, I think two key things have happened to cinema. It's been submitted both to the internet and it's been submitted to the generation of artists of which Steve is a major leading figure who were pioneering new modes of video installation, often using multiple screens, but most importantly, really taking the viewer much more seriously as uh, an engaged spectator, somebody who was often mobilized, who wasn't necessarily stationary, as we all are in this room at the moment, but really moving from screen to screen. But then subsequently he came full circle and has now returned to the cinema and has been making feature films, not least of which is 12 Years a Slave, which hopefully most of you have now seen in the past few weeks. Um, but I wanted to start initially with an image from a video called Illuminaire from 2001. If you can bring up the first slide, please. And this is a fairly less well-known video, I would say. I hadn't seen it until Steve's retrospective, which opened a year ago at the Art Institute of Chicago and then went to the Shaw Lager in Basel. It was an exceptional exhibition. But this video really captured my imagination, and I, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it ever since. And I see it as a real threshold, Steve, in your work between your earliest videos, which really were meant for the gallery and which were very much about you and your own body, um, and then the shift to these feature films in which you no longer appear except behind the camera. 
But there's something about the way that your body disappears. And correct me if I'm wrong, but basically the, the video was shot in a Paris hotel room just before an opening of your exhibition at Marion Goodman. Mm. And you were watching the television late at night and there was footage of a, from a documentary about um, a military action in Afghanistan. So the light that lights Steve's body is the light of violence. It's the light of atrocity and warfare in the Middle East. Um, but the camera that you used to capture this was just a small tripod camera on top of the monitor. So you also began to think about webcams in the era of um, internet pornography and a lot of other things that I think play into your work, in particular shame, mm -hmm. a few years later. But could you talk a little bit maybe about this shift in your work from your early use of your own body into becoming a director and really directing action from actors, not just um, bodies in a more abstract sense? Well, first of all, um, I was cheap. <laughs> and I was reliable. I will, will always be there. Um, no. Um, it was just a case of urgency. It was a case of um, wanting to sort of uh, be di as direct as possible and being present. Um, in a way, you could, you could think of it as, as some kind of performance in a way that one wanted to sort of not just be, not just sort of paint on the cameras, but be in the cameras as well and um, it was just one of those things where I was just just as a, a figure within a landscape I just wanted to sort of uh, experiment with that performing element as such and with this piece Illuminaire uh, it, it was very strange it was one of those situations where um, I was running out of time and it, it's very classic this is a very it's very classical in a way the the, the nude on the, on the nude figure on the bed you know um, and it's just one of those things where you you, you think of Suzanne, uh, uh, things like that. I mean, what was interesting for me was obviously, you know, if you hadn't realized that I'm, I'm, I'm black, hello, good evening, welcome, <laughs> um, on these sort of uh, white sheets. And it's just, just this whole contrast. And of course, what's making me visible is is the, those images of violence on, reflected on, on, the, on the television. And it was just, it was just very, I was interested in, 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 in the classical. I was interested in, in, of course, what you do in a hotel room on your own. I was interested in the sort of um, the, 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 the political aspect of, of our presence as such. Because as, as much as uh, we're, we're here through love, we're here through violence. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact, um, our, our presence here you know, through war, through warfare, through, you know, immigration, through um, whatever, as has led us to where we are sitting today, as well as love, of course. So that, those things I was sort of questioning and, and, uh, and, and looking at. Because I think there's this notion of 24-hour news and webcams and this kind of a camera whose eye never closes. It's constantly looking at us. But what's really interesting to me in this video is, unlike the later work where, um, the visual register in which you're operating is so crystal clear and sharp. Mm -hmm. This is a, a low-grade image. This is what Hito Steirel, who is an artist in the exhibition Nine Artists Upstairs, calls the poor image. Yes. It's an image where the digital image is, is degrading and dissolving, and the body is being dissolved by this kind of digital light. Well, yes, well, the camera is fighting to sort of make sense of the image. Uh, because it's it's sort of you know again it goes black it goes white and there's sort of a polarization there's a sort of flash flashes explosions you know gunfire and what happens in warfare of course is, is reflected on my body through through light and the camera is struggling to sort of keep up um, it's just just one of those things again it's very again it is very painfully in a way it is a, a certain situation of uh, the figure and uh, sort of a pictorial sort of sense as such. And that whole idea, it was, it just, it was just very, and again, it's just, it, it is, it is, it is the, the nude on the bed. It, it's so classical, but of course, with contemporary sort of splashes of color, of paint, which contemporary meaning the violence is making the image. So for me, that was fascinating. The, 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 brush, the brush strokes or the brush marks were uh, through images of, 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 of warfare as such. I guess I also wanted to start with this particular image because it does sort of highlight the monitor in your work. And I think mm -hmm. much of your earlier work was certainly invested in ideas that came out of artists like Bruce Nauman or Joan Jonas or Vito Akanshi, um, who were not making cinema. They were really making video for mm -hmm. the monitor. Mm -hmm. 
Subsequently, you know, you're obviously from a generation who expanded that into a larger dimension architecturally with larger projections. It was no longer a tube-based monitor, it was no. a projection. Um, and now you've come back to rooms like this, to the cinema. Um, so maybe just as we go along, it would be good to keep in mind, I think, how you use these different forms of cinema in your work and how you, I think, really address the entire spectrum for the earliest kind of cinema, you know, just a fascination with basic movement mm -hmm. um, and how that is constantly mediated by, I think, a really keen understanding of technology and what it does to us as bodies, as people, as political subjects. Um, on which note, if you could just go to the next slide. This shot, too, I think is an interesting foreshadowing of the opening scene in Shame, uh, in which mm. Michael Fassbender is also on this, um, mm -hmm. on the sheets, as it were. And if you could go to the next slide, please. And this is a billboard by Felix Gonzalez Torres. Some of you might have seen. Um, it's a, a very famous image that he took. Um, which, as often in his work, it deals with absence, with doubling, with lost desire, um, and with a body that has disappeared. Um, Felix was a very politically active artist. He was gay. Both he and his lover, who are somehow implicated in this image, both died of AIDS. And the way in which, Steve, your own body begins to disappear in a luminaire I'm very interested in. Um, and by the time later in this conversation we get on to 12 Years a Slave, I think we need to really think about the black body on screen and what you're doing with that and what your fascination is with making the invisible things that have gone, have disappeared or remained unseen visible in the work. Yeah, it was quite interesting because it reminds me of very much of this James Baldwin uh, uh, novel, The Evidence of Things Not Seen. And of course, we, we see them here. These two men, unfortunately, are no longer here, but there's the evidence of their presence. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, it's. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a shorthand, but we'll, we'll get to that point later. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, if you could actually go to the next slide. And again, I think this is an early example in your work of this idea of absence and presence kind of performing oh. each other. This is your own head kind of bobbing in oh. and out of the frame just above my head from 1996. Again, another Baldwin novel uh, title. Yeah, um, it's somewhere, this is somewhere in Devon, would you believe? And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It was, again, it was about... Uh, my head sort of bobs up and down as I, I come in out of frame. The camera's low, it was low down. And it was a situation where it was sort of it, it, entering the frame, or, or such, or the outsider or such, getting into the frame, or out of the frame, whatever. It was just a sort of a struggle to sort of have this kind of appearance, this kind of visibility. And how do you think, I mean, from these earlier videos, which, uh, you know, again, I don't know how many of you were able to see the retrospective at uh, Schaulager or in our, at the Art Institute of Chicago, but. The three, these three videos, which form a sort of trilogy, um, were shown really elegantly in this sort of triangular yes. configuration. But again, from the beginning, you were really emphatically trying to make the viewer aware of their own body encountering your body on screen. Yes, usually these, these images would be screens uh, sort of floor to ceiling, uh, side to side. So the whole back of the wall would be sort of um, engulfed with the image. There was no, uh, there was no frame as such. Um, and you'd walk into the space, which is, was about seven meters long, uh, four meters wide. So it was sort of all encompassing, as in you, there was no escape. And there was this whole idea of, of, about something which was larger than you. Um, in the cinema, obviously, you're sitting down comfortably, and, and, and within art space, you, you could play with that in the sense of um, you, you're, you're walking in, you're walking into, in, into a piece, you're standing up, and you can leave at, at any time. But there, you, there's this sort of confrontation with, 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 with the image. And I was interested in, in the whole idea of, of, of how you affect the image and, or how the image affects you as far as, say, these images had no sound, for example, so you became the soundtrack as such. Yeah, I mean, and if we go to the next slide, Five Easy Pieces, which no. is from around the same time. I mean, again, I think you have this idea of sort of space, levitation, the body sort of almost not set free per se, but unleashed in a different kind of spatial configuration, both on the screen and again to the architectural situation that it's presented. Yeah, I mean, Five Easy Pieces one was, again, it was, it was a piece of, of five different, to sort of say, practices. One was you know, these guys doing hula hooping, the other guy, one was a woman doing a tightrope walk, but they had the camera right underneath her feet as you, as you press down, you see the feet come into frame, and it almost like it would drag the camera along as such. And there was other, other, other aspects, which we, there was me actually, forgive me, pissing on, on the screen. 
um, as and it was it was, a lot, it was a lot to do with this. Just, it was of course it was some kind of exercises. What I mean by that was the, there was there was there was a tank which was the size of the actual camera frame. So forgive me, as I relieve myself, it was almost like I was on the audience as such. And the, this was fantastic patterns would, 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 would occur, but it was, all, it was all about this whole idea of, 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 of investigating or experimenting with the camera, where you could put the camera, where's the right or wrong place to put the camera. There is none such thing other than you know, good or bad with, uh, with how you sort of uh, perceive a narrative or perceive some kind of uh, uh, dialogue as such. But I think I mean, there was this really interest, I mean, strong interest in, in carving out a more prismatic experience where, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the perspectives are aerial points of view that, I mean, again, with the, the piss scene, you know, you have this you know, constant awareness of these different surfaces, different heights, yes. different situations sort of colliding and coming together. But you as an audience, of course, you know, again, uh, it's one of those things which I wanted to do. It's almost like a punk rock, you know, when people forgive me, spit on the on the audience. It was a sort of there was a sort of a gratification. Oh, thank you, he spat on me, fantastic. <laughs> but at the same, you know, it was just pushing those because I would spit as, as you do when you pee as a man. You guys, you know, moving on. Why we don't know. <laughs> Next, <laughs> habit, bad one. All right. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay. And this is Bear from 1993, which is also, like Illuminaire, one of my very favorite works of yours. But um, again, I mean, this is you featured very prominently on the screen in this yes. pas de deux with another mm -hmm. um, naked black male body. Mm -hmm. You circle around each other, you kind of test each other yes. out. It's very sexual, it's very homoerotic, um, but it also seems very unresolved. You're not exactly sure what this is leading to, mm -hmm. but there's a constant sense of negotiating each other and trying to understand some kind of community, some mm. sort of connection. Yeah, at the time, um, in the early 90s, the most exciting thing for cinema for me was um, queer cinema at the time. Mm. It was the most exciting sort of, I mean, it was cinema, it was film being used in a way which was trying to say something in a way. It, it was almost like, I imagine if you go back to the 60s and think of Godard or Truffaut or whatever, it was, for me, it was that kind of, uh, real kind of experimenting, not experimenting, but it, there was a reason why to use a camera as such. And not that I was trying to mimic that at all, far from it, but I was, there was, I was, I was definitely, I would say, influenced by that sort of experimental uh, uh, narrative of, of, of approach. And yeah, you know, it was just one of those sort of wonderful, it was, it was very, it was one of the most important times of my life as far as um, a bit being, uh, wanting to sort of make work, wanting to be an artist at that time. I mean, Two of the filmmakers within that generation that we've discussed before were mm. Todd Haynes and Derek Jarman. Yes, 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 yes. And I, th I don't remember if I mentioned this to you, but um, there's another wonderful black British filmmaker named John Acomfra, mm -hmm. um, who we might maybe get onto in a little bit later um, in, the, in the conversation. But John had told me a story about he would occasionally show Derek Jarman films to all black audiences in Brixton, mm -hmm. all black male audiences in Brixton, mm -hmm. which were perceived as largely homophobic. And mm -hmm. then he would show Derek's films and there would be an initial kind of uproar and then he would really bring them to his side and they would have a very deeply political discussion about what mm -hmm. these films meant. Um, and I guess I would like to ask, you know, where does your interest lie in that sort of political approach to cinema? I think it's everything. I think even falling in love uh, is political. You know, I don't think it is that you can actually negotiate your way out of it at all um, uh, in, 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 in any any way. So it's sort of it goes hand in hand. I don't think you know you know again it's even a cup of tea is political. You know, <laughs> you know, tea comes from you know where does tea come from? Where does sugar come from? And you know in, in you know in the day in England, the sugar from the West Indies, tea from India it was colonial. It was, you know, so it's the most simplest thing. Not quite loaded. Yeah. And how did you feel in terms of connecting this body work we've just looked at to artists like Nauman or Dan Graham or Von Rain or that, that earlier generation who were largely all white? I mean, to what ex how important was it to you to have the black body as a major central? Well, it wasn't, you know, again, I don't really see myself as a black body. I, and I, I'm a geezer, a bloke, you know, I don't really you know, walk down the street thinking, oh, I'm a black person. <laughs> So no, it becomes a situation of more to the, I mean, as far as Nauman or, 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 or um, Dan Graham is concerned, there's definitely a, a, a starting point, but my work from, from day one was always cinematic. I was always interested in, in, in cinema, uh, rather than uh, uh, um, you know, uh, illustration, I was interested in filmmaking mm. as such. 
And I think there lies the difference uh, as far as that, their work was very much, very illustrative, very uh, f f formal to some extent. I think, you know, what I was interested in, at the same time, you know, I'm looking at sort of Quism and, and Godard and, and, and whatnot. Uh, yes, I'm looking at, um, you know, um, Jean Vigo. You know, John Vigo, um, exactly, John Vigo, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, those kind of artists, uh, sorry, filmmakers rather, artists, filmmakers, filmmakers, artists, whatever. Um, <laughs> It's kind of you know it was a kind of a, a mash. It was more of a, a of of how can you push this particular medium within a certain kind of interesting context. And Jarman is actually one of the few who actually was an artist uh, who became a, was a filmmaker, but also he was an interesting theatre designer. So there was a lot of interesting sort of uh, um, uh, sort of collab collage or collab I don't know whatever you call it. There was a kind of uh, a mixing of, of of styles as such. I'm also curious, um, I mean, in London, mm -hmm. at oh, Goldsmiths, yes, yes, yes. in the 90s, yeah. um, context, yeah. and in the context of the Turner Prize, which oh. you won in 99, I mean, suddenly there's this explosion of artists in Britain, mm. you, Douglas Gordon, Jane and Louise Wilson, um, etc., all working in video, and in, often in multiple screen video. Where did that come from? I think it came a lot from a frustration that we couldn't make feature films. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I mean, they we're very poor. Um, you know, um, we don't have really an urban industry. I think there was always this ambition, I think, that people, even if it was in the art context, that there was all this cinema, was a huge, um, uh, you know, want. But um, it was so far away from us. I mean, by the time I left, I left Goldsmiths and, and grad film, I applied to NYU and I, and, and I got in. But I was only there for three months because I hated it. So I got, came back to England to do, to, to do art. There was, I, th I just think that was that has a lot to do with it. Actually, I'm actually thought of that in in, in, in a world, but I think that that had a lot to do with it. And uh, again, there was a real kind of um, there were possibilities in art which there were not in cinema. We couldn't go out at 22, 21, 23 years old and make feature films, but we could go out and make artworks and, and be ambitious within that context. I think that, that, was, that was one of the reasons. More than a few people have compared you to Jarman in the sense that you have turned the film industry on its ear. You've introduced a completely different kind of language into industrial commercial filmmaking. And you know, he was always playing this dance around um, the underground, the British Film Institute, mm -hmm. kind of playing between the official institutions and something a bit more independent and more experimental. Um, I mean, do you feel um, there's a resonance between what you were doing and what he's doing? Uh, with Jarman? Yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, um, and I think it, w it is because um, I was so much more interested in story, narrative. I think John was always uh, the experimental artist, Jim, uh, sorry, um, Dirk Jarman, who uh, was was a, was a was a was a, an, a, a gay uh, filmmaker, a, a amazing uh, gay filmmaker who was. I mean, he wasn't just a gay filmmaker. I'd label him like that. But it was it was it was one of our foremost filmmakers uh, in in Britain. Um, and um, I think that he was m more interested within the sort of. Again, it's Jack Goldstein in, in, in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, it was more. He was more like a, 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 a I would say, a, a, a Matthew Barney person within the context of the, there was there was the, uh, there was the na narrative wasn't, you know, a straightforward narrative filmmaker wasn't his interest, mm -hmm. um, and I not say that it's mine, but the, 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 what I produced, the three three, three, three films I produced are much more in a t somehow a, a traditional sense of storytelling. I mean, something else I've been curious about for a long time is, I mean, your career kind of coincides, parallels a situation in Britain which becomes increasingly commercial, increasingly, mm. um, I mean, if Bear is 93, mm. seven years later, Tate Modern opens, White Cube mm -hmm. is in high gear, selling mm. Damien Hirst and those mm -hmm. kinds of artists. Um, but there are pr other precedents for your work that really have nothing to do with that, in particular, John Acomfra and the Black mm. Audio Film Collective. Mm -hmm or to some extent even, I would say, the London Filmmakers Co-op and earlier British structuralist cinema, which, like you, I think, was very invested in the politics yes. architecturally of the cinematic space. I'm interested, I'm just put it with context, you know, in, in England, Britain, film was always seen, uh, to some extent, as political. The I mean, I wouldn't say the majority, because there was you know, the people who obviously, you know, wanted to make, but the, a lot of film art, 
uh, particularly film was seen as a, a, a political tool to, 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 to experiment with and to sort of uh, push forward. Um, and for me, yes, I come from that tradition, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm cut from that cloth, absolutely. Uh, but for me, I, oh, I don't know, at the same time, I always, what do they want? I, I always, at the same time, wanted to tell stories. I think not to say that stories uh, forbid you from, 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 from doing what, what, they, what those guys were doing, but they, we never had money. We never had any money. We never, I mean, I was a London film co-op. My God, it was like freezing cold. <laughs> there were these like six soups, they were freezing, it was so cold. It was like electric heater. And then, you know, and then there was a woman just telling you how to sort of, uh, how to load a, 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 a super rate Bolex and stuff. And you're free to, that 10 of you paid your, your, your 10 pound to be there. And you know, it was really, it was, yeah, that was, that was Britain in those days. It was, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was, really was. Can you show the next slide, please? So this is from Drumroll, and we can only show a single frame here, but it's actually a three-screen video installation. But in terms of storytelling, I mean, in these kinds of videos, I think, again, you're referencing slapstick and very early, mm -hmm. early, early 20th century modes of filmmaking, and kind of leading on into the idea of a narrative or a story. Sort of. I mean, I'll explain. But unfortunately, I don't like to show my images on, unless they're not in, in the right particular context. So I apologize for that, but I'll explain what's going on here, because oh, what the, what's going on here is upside down, you would be saying. But what, actually what's happening is that I, what I happened with this piece called drum roll, and I, what it is, I was just interested in, in, in as being as economical as I can with a, a, a film about movement. And I thought, to myself, okay, well, what I'll do is I get an oil drum, you know, probably I'd have a whole drum and movement and you know, gas. But all I'll do is I'll put holes in, in the axis, or you know, turn it on its side, put a hole in the axis here, axis here, and one in the middle, as such, you know, of, of the drum. And I just roll this, this oil drum around my, my gallery on, on, I think, 50, 57th and, and, and 5th Avenue. Um, and it was, it was a bit of a palab. I was wearing this pink coat, why? I don't know. Um, I had one, um, and I was rolling this 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 this, 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 this thing around because I love the idea of the economic of movement and 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 and, and, uh, and filming it, and it became this this sort of sort of the, the rolling of, again at that time it was it was uh, it was tape, so everything was rolling, the, the tape was rolling, the drum was rolling, everything was it was moving. I just love the idea of this sort of trilogy, this 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 this. this, this uh, not diptych, I'm going mad. Um, this whole idea of a triptych, excuse me, going mad, of this triptych, which was sort of just about movement. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what I did. That's, that's what I did. But in videos like this and in Deadpan, which we don't have a still for, but there is sort of an implicit violence, but then there's also a degree of humor that maybe softens the violence a little bit. Sure, sure. I was looking at the searches the other day, feature film. It was interesting because I was just thinking, my God, this, 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 they're killing these Indians. The Indians are trying to kill them. They're burning, you know, they're, 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 they're terrible raping people and stuff in the searches. But it's always under, John Ford always undercuts it with humor. Out of nowhere, in the most horrendous situations, there's this thing called humor. I have to, I have to learn that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite wonderful. Um, anyway, moving on, I just throw that in there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Next. <laughs> so, the more recent films, maybe the humor has subsided a bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's have the first clip, please, from Hunger.
So, going from this early work, which was so thoughtfully about bodies and the relationships between them, and really using the screen in a completely different way to activate the viewer and their own awareness of um, their own body, their own situation. And then to go into these kinds of films where that physical intensity has translated into a very different approach, um, where it's back to the single screen, um, but it, it still really penetrates quite strongly. And I th I mean, I'm also interested, I guess, if you go back and you think about the Felix Gonzalez Torres image or Illuminaire and this idea of the disappearing body, Bobby Sands going on hunger strike and letting his own body waste away, um, you know, for a very uh, specific political purpose. Mm -hmm. But how do you, um, I mean, at what point did you decide you were interested in Bobby Sands and at what point, how did you begin to bridge no. your gallery practice with this kind of filmmaking? Well, I'll start with how I started the idea of work, uh, making a film with Bobby Sands. I was 11 years old, and on television, um, there was always the image of this guy, you know, at the time when I was 11 years old, and underneath his, uh, and then underneath his image was a number. And the next day I saw it on television, BBC News, we, we religiously watched, uh, the number had changed. And I asked my mother, well, I thought I, thought, I thought, I must have thought it was his age. And I asked my mother, well, why is this numbers changing on this, on this, on this guy? And she said, uh, he's on hunger strike. And I, I didn't understand, hunger strike? And she said to me that, you know, in order to be heard, he stopped eating. And it was one of those strange moments when you're 11 years old, I think you're, you're, try, you're, you're trying to do the maths, and you're like, eating, being heard, and everything, going to the mouth. And, you know, I thought to myself, well, I understood it, and I, and I could relate to it in a way. I thought, to myself, well, yes, it's, it's almost like, you know, as, I mean, as we all can to a certain extent, you know, as a child, you know, you've been there with your mother and father s or says to you, you know, if you, you know, if you don't, you're not going to leave this table until you finish eating that food. And the only control you have, you know, is, is abstaining from eating. I mean, what time you go to bed, what clothes you wear, you know, what time you get up, it's all your, your control. And the only control you have is, 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 is through your body. And I remember in my research um, for, 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 for hunger, I remember reading three days before Bobby Sands, after Bobby Sands died, it, and Pauline Kael had an in, did an interview with uh, Goddard, where Goddard said um, the reason why the, the, the Barnum uh and Bobby Sands are interesting or important because they're childish. I was like, well, I couldn't, what was he mean Goddard? Of course, Goddard being Goddard, you, think you start scratching your head and think I'm trying to do it. And I, talked, I kind of understood in a way through what I was thinking about when I was 11 years old. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're young, there's a sense of morals, which are sort of very forthright and such. And the whole idea of this abstinence and using one's body as a, as a weapon, in a way, um, sort of just stuck with me. And of course, at a certain moment, um, I mean, I, I never, you know, the whole idea of, of having a career in film, so a career, almost almost spit when I when I hear it. It was never interest. That was never interesting for me. It was the reason why I wanted to make a film about hunger was because the subject, which was was, was stay with me for such a long time, asked to be narrative, a narrative film. It could have been, it could have asked to be a sculpture, it could have asked to be a painting, it could have asked to be something else, but it asked to be a narrative film. So I had to facilitate that through um, uh, making a feature film. Um, but this is not a conventional narrative film, and I think no. when you mentioned earlier this interest in what's outside of the frame, or as I mentioned earlier, sure. this, you know, your intense desire to take repressed histories and make them intensely, mm. like physically visi visible. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Well, maybe let's just show the next clip quickly, and then sure. we'll get back sure, to sure. this idea of narrative filmmaking and why this is not a conventional documentary or narrative about a mm. specific historical figure. Okay.
faced now with the failure of their discredited cause. The men of violence have chosen in recent months to play what may well be their last card. They've turned their violence against themselves through the prison hunger strike to death. They seek to work on the most basic of human emotions, pity, as a means of creating tension and stoking the fires of bitterness and hatred. So this is not conventional cinema or documentary cinema or narrative cinema. And you've segued from pissing onto the lens of your own camera to shooting the piss of the prisoners, which is the only remaining trace that you see of them in this empty hallway. And yet, without really giving too much away, this is one of the greatest indictments of Mrs. Thatcher, who's also disembodied, and all you really, the only evidence of her is her voice. Mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, what was interesting for me was this whole battle, you know, there's always, always a battle. Um, I mean, what you see there is, is, is actually what happened. Once the guys, would, would, what they would do, would they, would, they would, of course, s s smear their excrement on the walls inside their prison cells. It was called the dirty protest. They went on for five years. There was a no-wash no uh, protest. And then what they would do was they pour the urine out underneath the door into, into the corridor. And the ritual was that, um, that every, every night the, the, the prison officer would go there with a, a, a bottle of detergent, as, 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 you, as you see, and pour it you know, on, onto the piss and uh, you know, start to clean it up, of course. And some of the people that, that he didn't like or he thought were the one leads, leaders, or, leaders of the, 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 the IRA in prison, he would sweep it underneath their door. So their, their, their rooms would be flooded with, a, you know, with this urine and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, detergent. And there was this ritual, there was this ritual, ritual. And this comes after a very long sequence of, of, of Bobby Sands talking to a priest about why um, he wanted to sort of uh, go on hunger strike. And again, it's one of those sort of scenes which after such a long, intense uh, conversation, this is a, almost like a lull, a, you know, where you just lull, you, lull, you allow the audience to digest this huge, you know, quite forceful bit of information where, you know, Bobby Sands is, is saying to the priest, that he wants to die, that, he want, you know, that he, he's going to sort of, you know, go on hunger strike t to the death. Um, and the whole idea of this, of this sequence, as far as you said, conventional c c cinema, I mean, I don't know what conventional cinema is, really. I mean, I, 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 I just, I just, again, I, I was, you know, it, uh, there's this thing called Hollywood or American films, which is apparently maybe that's conventional, apparently. But, you know, I was looking at films from all over the world and I tried to sort of get an idea. I mean, we were very, I was very lucky when I was growing up in England in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the late, very, very uh, early 90s, that we had great repertory cinemas where they would show double bills of, you know, films you know, from Korea to sort of, you know, um, you know, Turkey to France, you know, to, you know, of course, America and, and everywhere around the world. It was huge retrospects. Every week we had this, this cinema system which would only show old films. So it was almost like looking at the classics, almost like reading the classics. Mm -hmm. I used to do, you know, as a student, uh, you know, definitely I used to sort of at least see five films a week. So the whole idea of what was possible, what was not, was always uh, interesting to me. And also what you could find yourself, because this, this, this shot, after we, the, the, sh the idea was to do um, just a sweeping, but then afterwards I just, after I saw what happened, I thought, oh my God, they said, this is a map, this is a map. And they didn't know what I was talking about. I said, Sean, Bobby, my cameraman, who's been working with for 13 years, we need to sort of trace this with, with the camera. So it was one of those things which occur often uh, through um, the moment. And it makes sense to you then because it, it, it does make sense in a, in a linear way. So, you know, again, even with 12 Years a Slave, I mean, I'm very surprised that, um, you, know, you know, Fox wants to distribute it. I'm very surprised that people want to see it in, 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 a, in, a, in a large number, you know, of, well, fingers crossed, we're opening tonight on 1,144 1, cinemas. I'm like, really? I'm really kind of, um, so it's not, I'm, I've never tried to do anything uh, I mean, I never tried to do anything to sort of make my films friendly anyway. Just, I just wanted to sort of tell some kind of a truth within what I was doing. That, that was my criteria. I never was thinking about making a, a, a dime. I never have. I mean, I worked in supermarkets before, but that was it. I never, I was never got into this to make bloody money, for sure not. <laughs> so, you know. But I mean, I think maybe the three 
major things that a lot of critics talk about when mm -hmm. they talk about the feature films that maybe distinguish distinguishes what you do from other filmmakers um, is again this intense physicality, yeah. your particular use of sound, mm -hmm. and the long duration. The, these kinds of takes which really come much more out of Warhol or Chantal Ackerman than they do other kinds of filmmaking. And so mm -hmm. where, uh, I mean, it's almost back to this idea of the camera that doesn't close its eye, you know, it's this unwavering gaze. Yes, but also there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's also the language, I mean, cinema, how, long, how old is cinema? 130 years old, possibly. I mean, it's such a, it's, it's a baby, I mean, in the way that how we look at things. So there is no conventional way of, of looking at anything other than if it's right or wrong or boring or not, or does it make sense or, or does. So for me, the whole idea of, uh, for example, I'll take the first, last question first, the sort of the, the holding shots, for example, in, in, in 12 Years a Slave, you did a, there's a shot of, um, you know, it's lots, there's a few long shots or you know, hunger or, 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 or shame. It's about real, it's, you know what, it's about real time. In, in the movie where it's we are cutting and you know we're having film time, real time, so the audience is sort of engaged with something um, at that present moment in time. So you, you obliterate the frame and you allow people to sort of enter and be present, similar to, yes, yeah, similar to the earlier works in a way. Mm -hmm. Be present with the image. The, 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 somehow I want, I want the frame to evaporate and they're present with that image then and then then and now, we are in real time now. I mean, sometimes, again, it's, we'll, we'll see a couple of examples, I imagine, uh, and we could talk through it. Well, there was two other things which I forgot about, sorry. Sound. Sound, okay, sound design, okay, sound design. Um, uh, I think, because we had we have great radio in, 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 in Britain, I mean, great radio, and as a kid growing up, I mean, you pull on the radio and you're, you know, you're in the Amazon, and you're there, you know, you hear, you, know, you hear the cutlass thrashing through the sort of undergrowth, you're sort of, you know, embedded, you hear the birds and stuff, you're, you're rambling, you're, you're, you're somehow you, you've transported yourself through into this tropical rainforest. Um, as far as the television, you put a TV on, it's something which, which is remote, it's in the box, and it's sort of, it's almost like a fish tank. You're not immersed in it, and that's what, what was interesting with, with sound, is that the, you, so it does so much, so much a better job sometimes than the, 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 than, than the actual images. And again, it's a sense of, you know, I always want like that, the idea of, 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 of uh, this idea of, of, you know, someone blindfolding you and, throw, and pushing you into someone's apartment and through touch and, 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 and uh, to sense and all your other senses other than your eyes, you sort of try to make your, negotiate your way around this room. And that's what I want, to sort of have that sensual experience, uh, uh, experience for, for the audience when they're in a situation of sound, because, you know, again, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like smell, you know, again, you know, it, 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 that's, that, that's the thing that brings out the, 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 the best, not images, not photographs of your family, or it's, it smell is such, it brings such a, a powerful sense of memory, doesn't it? Huge, and I, those elements, those other senses, I'm, I'm trying to sort of somehow trick in some ways with the audience, not trick necessarily, it's a horrible word, but to sort of, uh, sort of uh, introduce as such, in a, in a way. There was one more I can't remember. Well, I mean, just to develop that point, because I think this is an, it's something I'm, why, mm. partly why I showed Illuminaire at the beginning, is yes. this, this, again, threshold between the virtual and the real, that I mm. think is what's one of the major things at stake in your work. This idea that, I mean, we'll get on to shame in just a minute, but this idea that it is about a sex addict, that his whole life is controlled by physical desire and by, mm. you know, um, a robotic desire to touch in a very different way than the one you're describing. But that is framed within this, again, the digital light, the digital world, the world of laptop screens and addiction. Um, but in terms of, I mean, there are a lot of artists at the moment, and I would actually say arguably maybe particularly in Britain, like Ed Atkins and James Richards, who I think their work is really about trying to navigate the haptic in the digital world. So, you know, within the sea of images and information mm -hmm. and virtuality, trying to reclaim a sense of place and a sense of touch and the ability to have that direct contact, which we're actually losing to some extent, um, which is a very abstract thought, but I think it is happening. Yeah. Um, so how does that play into your interest in, in touch and physical sensation? Well, I, 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 I think cinema. <laughs> I fast forward into cinema, I jumped into cinema because you know, having an audience um, and being present with the audience while you're watching something is, I mean, it's, 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 it's it, it's, it just shows you how relevant it is still and how powerful it is still. I mean, you know, you know, with, with the film I Was a Slave, there's so much debate going on about that particular film, uh, about the subject matter. As I said before, you've seen the program notes, yes, 
that film could be a starting a starting point for a conversation. It's that powerful. You know, arguing, discussing, agreeing, finding out, thinking. Um, so that's my way in order to come out of that sort of, uh, how can I say, um, that kind of uh, play the spaghetti as such as what was going on now. It's just in a messy and to come out of that and to, to, be, uh, to be clear or such, or to be singular. I mean, do you think, and particularly as an artist whose work really came to the fore in the 90s and a generation mm -hmm. which is largely associated now with relational aesthetics or other means of generating some kind of collectivity or some kind of community or some kind of an interrogation of togetherness of different kinds. And do you think the politics in the room of being together in a cinema like this, with real bodies next to real bodies, is different than the kind of networking that happens online and the kinds of community formation? Oh, absolutely, there? absolutely. And why? I mean, I'll just give an example. Uh, there was um, uh, a producer friend of mine um, who um, was working for Channel 4, was, was in Tor Toronto, and um, he was going to view 12 Years a Slave. And uh, you sit next to this, he's a white guy, he was sitting next to this black woman, American, he's English, uh, she was about 45 or so, he says. He see, she sat next to him and said, hello, and she started talking to him, so oh, I've been queuing for a couple, an hour or so to get in, and said, oh, great. And they sat there and, and watched the movie. Uh, towards the end always the, of the movie, he said he felt a hand slide across his hand and they held each other's hand. And uh, towards, the, obviously, when the end, towards the end of the movie, the, the, when the end of the movie ended, they, they, they started to cry and, and held each other and, 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 and held on to each other. Now, that's not rare uh, with, you know, which, uh, this is strange with 12 Years a Slave because we've had a lot of, uh, you know, with, with other festivals and so forth and what we've experienced. And that kind of uh, feeling of humanity and I mean, that answers your question. I mean, it's the power of cinema. I mean, it's, 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 it's huge. It's just huge. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's to be, you know. I mean, maybe um, as a counterpoint, we could show the clip from Shame, um, because arguably Michael Fassbender's character is experiencing the opposite completely situation. Yeah. Let's have a look at that now. Um, show the next clip from Shane as well, and then we'll just dive in after that.
Brandon, it's Sissy. I really need to talk to you. Please, will you pick up the fucking phone? Brandon, I need you. We're not bad people. We just come from a bad place. So with this film, you're dealing with a really intense kind of urban alienation. It's exactly the opposite of the collectivity we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, I, you know, 90% no, of the internet traffic is pornography, people looking at pornography in one way, shape, form, the other webcams, you know, it's, uh, films, whatever. Well, and again, it, there's, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 I don't know if it's, a, I don't know if it's, it's a new addiction, but it's an addiction, obviously, where, where it's become to the fore. I came to the fore for me. I mean, one knew about it, you know, through you know celebrities and like you know, Michael Douglas and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, Tiger Woods. And at the time of making it, Tiger Woods into the came came happened in London. I wanted to make the film in London, but you know, knowing the media, no one wanted to talk to us because they thought we were part of the media. And I think with, with, with sex addiction, it's just sort of finding out about it and uh, you know talking to experts because we came to New York to make the film in the end because that that you know that that was a place we thought would be the best place. The whole idea of access. Uh, you know, uh, and, and demand at any time. You, you, I thought this was a, the best, that, that was the best place for it, that film. And of course, talking to experts in the field, the sort of, the, the sort of um, pain and the sort of sense of, uh, you know, one or, I think we, we all here know someone who, you know, is or was, or maybe are for the people who have alcohol problems or issues. And you, you think of um, the, the, the Billy Wilder movie, um, um, uh, Lost Weekend, <clears throat> which was a huge sensation, and uh, you know, and 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 in the in the forties when, when it when it was made, um, and you know, to fast forward to to to, to you know, what I wanted to deal with, with with shame because again, it's another avenue to for one to lose themselves through through sex, sexual addiction, and of course, there's you know, there's lots of that uh, sort of um, you, there's an accessibility to 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 is it pornography or whatever it is to sort of. You know, to sort of manifest that 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 that, that, that state, and it was just one of those things where it it's, I just wanted to sort of look at that because it was about you know all of us here, um, uh, you know, I imagine ninety nine or ninety eight percent of us are, have arrived there through sex, and you know I imagine in, in the high nineties we all have participated in, in sex. Of course, as a, you know, I say high nineties because it may be the obviously percentage that have haven't, <laughs> and um, I just wanted to do to have, make a film where people had a relationship. To what the character was going through, but again, it's like alcohol. You drink it, but you know some people obviously don't go over the top. It's just it was just very interesting to me to look at that whole idea of the body and 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 and, and needing someone else to gratify that uh, um, ad addiction. And I mean, we've talked before mm -hmm. about the light in this film, which again, it's the light of laptops. It's the light. It's this very mm -hmm. white, very alienating light. It's not really the light of cinema as we once knew it, which was a very amber, warm, mm -hmm. welcoming light. Um, and I mean, light and darkness play such critical roles in your work, I think, um, the way in which, certainly in a film like Western Deep, you know, where um, sure. darkness is one of the key characters almost. Well, it's kind of interesting, the dark, and, you know, it's kind of interesting. You could, you could tell more about an image or tell more about a, see, a, a situation through darkness, because half the time we look at, you know, we're not, when we look at something, everything's not in sharp focus. You know, it's more sort of obscured, it's more, it's more we, we read more in between the lines than actually what, in actually what we see. And I think with, with the film as an as a, as a, as a, as a, as a image or quality, just as uh, when we look at something, we, it's much more real. It's much more, there's a much, real is not a word, but it's, it's much more based in reality. A certain kind of darkness, a certain kind of obscurity, because you, it, you, it, 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 it puts you into a certain state, state of mind where you're. It's another kind of uh, you're thinking about what you're looking at. In a way, I'm, I'll, I'll get there. I'll be better in a second. I just, I'm, I'm climbing. I've got, I've, I've got the idea. It's going to be formulated in the next clip. I'm getting there. Maybe it's a little bit like it's a little bit, it's a little bit like Braille in a way. When you feel it, you know it. 
There's a, you know, it, you don't have to show. It's like you know, it's about something which is it's almost like a veil, a veil over someone's eyes. It's 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 kind of interesting. It, it, it says more about the the, the 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 image than it would do if it was sort of visible. It's strange, but true. But I mean, you've spoken previously about why you chose New York for this film in particular. Yes. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about the kind of research you did and why New York City? Well, New York City was because the access and, and uh, you know, it's a 24 hour city. And I thought that character of Brandon, you know, the whole idea that he was getting what he wanted when he wanted. Um, and also the choice of what you want, how you want. I mean, you know, the choice of, for example, forgive me, uh, pro prostitutes and stuff. I mean, you get whatever you want. And it's the whole, uh, the, the, the accessibility, and, which is New York. Um, and the whole idea of, of what we the 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 the, the, the experts in, in 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 the field were in, in New York and speaking to them about, you know, again, there's there's a huge you know sexual addiction within you know minority com communities, huge, because it's all it's 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 it's, it's just a, a, about some kind of gratification, um, and you know within Wall Street, of course, there's you know that was that that, that that's always the sort of one people talk about because it's a case of a certain kind of. Uh, Gratification. It, it, it's it's a it's a very odd. Um, it, you know, again, I, I got a lot of st I, 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 it's, I, you get a lot of st you get a lot of stones thrown at you because it's to do with sex. Ah, there's no such thing as sex addiction. Nah. but you know, it's it's a, just another way of losing oneself um, through an activity of getting high. I mean, you know, if it's drugs, if it's, if it's whatever, it's, it's uh, sex, it's, it's, it's alcohol. And to what extent, I mean, what you said earlier about the frame and trying to dissolve the frame or that barrier between the audience and the screen, how does that play into the idea that in really all three of your feature films, you're dealing with prisons, you're dealing with cellular confinement of some kind, whether yeah. it's through addiction, through imprisonment, or Interesting, you no, know, because, I mean, to me, there was a direct line from Bobby Sands to, to, to Brandon, uh, Brandon Sullivan here. Uh, played by Bobby Sands, um, played by Michael Fesbinder. In the way that you know, you have Bobby Sands, who's who's actually you know in, in prison in a in an Irish uh, in a, in, a, in a British prison cell, designed to keep the binomial of basically the prison. The, the H blocks was designed by Germans to keep the, the binomial of which was transported to Northern Ireland. And you got this guy in, in a solitary confinement, uh, but within that uh, environment, he transcends his environment through owning it, through him controlling who he was within that and sort of having a sense of freedom within that confines of a prison cell in the North Sea. Then you've got the opposite of that, the complete opposite of that is Brandon, who is in an access for everything sort of environment in New in, in York City. Um, you know he's um, you know he's you know very well paid. He's has, he's a, he has a total absolute freedom, but through his freedom, he has put himself into a prison, his own prison, um, and that's often you know again we, there was a lot of people talking you know we, we we did a lot of research. It was a lot to do with people's backgrounds and you know um, and, and and parents and and, 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 and and you know there's lots of things happen. I mean you, again. When you see Brandon in the film with 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 with, um, with, 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 with Sissy, his sister, they never speak about their parents. Never. You imagine when your brother said this, a, a conversation with their parents would, would occur. They never do. Um, and it's not to give anything away. It's just to do with you know certain people's circumstances and how you know what happens. How, what, you know, we're all here because our friends, our, our parents, you know, fucked us up a bit, obviously. And um, <laughs> but it, it, it's just it was interesting to sort of dwell, dwell into that. Sorry, I'm going on a bit, but it was just interesting to. to to dwell over into that, and it's, it's just completely opposite. I want to make a character that's completely opposite to, to, to Bobby Sands, but about now. Um, and I think you know, I mean, you know, it, it is. It was. It was just one of those things where we had to sort of. I had to go there, really. I mean, arguably, but, um, Brandon's problems are first world problems. Yeah, I mean, it's the most difficult film to think about to, 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 to talk about because it's you know you could talk about hunger in this way, to have a save this way. I think this one because it's it's so kind of. Um, it's, people often don't care about Brandon, and understandable. Why should I care about this good-looking guy who's a sex addict? But you know, it's it's not just it's too it's too easy to, to brush people off in that way. It's just too easy. But maybe before we get on to Twelve Years a Slave, I just wanted to quickly talk about Gravesend and Western Deep Please. as well, and maybe set the stage for you know relations between. I mean, even the fact that I mean, talking about digital culture and its impact on somebody like Brandon, and then to go to Coltan, the mineral that's mined in the Congo, which is one of the 
primary subjects in, in, no. um, in Gravesend. And could you bring up the, the still from Gravesend, please? Okay, well, you know, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is in a place called Wali Kali, um, uh, in the middle of the Congo, which um, I flew into, look at it, in Google Earth, it's just bush. It's, it's crazy. It's a, so it's a very dangerous place. Um, we flew in there. From, we flew in there with you know with the, the planes, uh, the, the wing the wings of the planes clipping foliage. We get in there, and the Russian pilot, dodgy Russian pilots. Everything is dodgy that out, out there. We you know we 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 we, we trekked for 50 kilometers in, in, in after we landed, and then we got to this place, this clearance um, where we thought we, we saw these kind of miners. Next morning, all the miners were dressed in military uniform, and we were taken to this place where they dug coltane. A coltane, if you don't know, is in it's in your pocket right now. It's in every digital electronic piece of equipment. It's a, it's a conductor. It doesn't overheat. And in 1999, um, coltan, a kilo of coltan was $100. $100. So lawyers and doctors were you know, putting their hats and canes behind them and going into the bush and digging this thing out because it's shallow mining. Uh, what happened at that time, I think, I think it was PlayStation 2 occurred. Uh, where it, it sort of it, 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 it pushed the price up of, of, of coal into a, a record high, and there was some kind of collapse in the market. People, people were buying it, buy, were stockpiling it. So there was this huge thing, which was called black gold. It is called black gold, and it's, obviously I'm sure people here know about it. So I, w but I was interested in filming that process, filming the sort of the, the, the actual that, that, that mining, and it was linked to another piece I did called Western Deep, which was. Um, in South Africa. Uh, Bring up the still from Western Deep, please. South Africa, which is um, a, a, a mine just outside of, of, of Johannesburg, uh, which is, uh, is, is, is three and a half miles on, on, on the ground. This mine is the deepest mine in the world. And it's a gold mine. Uh, and it has 5,000 men working on it every, every, every day. And it was, I was just interested in that whole idea of, again, it's just a, it was a case of, this was the first thing I did with Sean Bobbitt, by the way, my cinematographer I've been working with for 13 years, who have sh it's an art piece where we've been, you know, shot all my um, uh, feature films. Um, uh, anyway, we shot on Super 8 camera, but I'll get back to the, what, 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 was, what I was just, just talking about before. And it was just all about that kind of holiday of minerals and, and the depths. I mean, gold isn't rare, it's just difficult to get. And it just was interesting because we would, we would go down this, this elevator shaft and then we would walk and then catch a train. And then we'd go down the elevator shaft and then walk and get it. Because it would do that, to obviously had to stagger it, otherwise the whole hook would collapse. And then we, it, it basically takes three hours to get to the face of the, the, the mining and three hours to go back up. So you can imagine during the apartheid time, they just keep people down there because there were less productivity. Now, obviously, they can't do that. It's sort of, you know, it's, tw you know, it's like 10 hour days. So they've only got sometimes they've only got um, three hours, four hours of work, because they have to change the, the, the travel to get up to the surface takes three hours, three hours and, and down three hours just to get to the surface. So it's, it was just. What, did, do we have another slide of it? The, the, the guys in there? Oh no. Okay. Anyway, um, and it was just one of those sort of places where there was this regime there, which is incredible. Unfortunately, we don't have a slide of it, where every miner once a year has to be tested. Is for their fitness, and what they do is they they're given these sort of blue, sort of bright blue loincloths. They're naked, and they are put into this room, which is heated. Some like it's a sauna, basically, heated to the temperatures you will find underground. It's, it's it is piping hot down there, and uh, there there's this, there's about I don't know seven or eight long slabs going to a, in, a, a room which is I don't know, I'll say meters. What is was it in feet? I don't know. Uh, I will say about twenty. Five meters long, 30 meters long room, which I don't know what it converts into feet, but quite long. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's, it's about the yeah, stage to there, the stage, and uh, you know, in a kind of wide room. And these guys would have to do the, the steps, and there'll be this noise of meh, meh, this light red light going up and going down, where you have to sort of do these steps. And it's just, it's like something out of a slave ship or a concentration camp image. I mean, you got, you got, I don't know how many people in that room, you got, there's about 200 men, 250 men in this room, going up and down, and up and down. I mean, just to test their fitness. The situation of these guys would, would, would not, they would not be from South Africa. None of them are, they're from Angola or neighboring African countries. They would come uh, for work, to mine. And basically that room was not a room of exercise, it was not a room, it was a room of testing. And if you, if you, if you didn't pass that test, well that's it your livelihood, your family, 
I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a test of, of, of survival. I mean, it was really, you know, it was, a, it was brutal. Where do you, I mean, in terms of, I mean, there are maybe interesting correspondences between that scene, between the scene we showed from Hunger when the beating of the shields, and these very almost militaristic formations um, with repetitive gestures. Um, I mean, where did, how did you begin to kind of hone this interest in, in very specific kinds of gestures? I mean, in a way it relates to your earliest work as well, I think. <laughs> Cruelty is formal. <laughs> I mean, you know. Cruelty is formal. I Absolutely. mean, there you go. I mean, you, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, I think we should. We're running short on time, so if you could show the first clip from Twelve Years a Slave, which also has a strong resonance, I think, with what we've just been mm -hmm. discussing. Ah, Mr. Ford. Splendid seeing you, sir. What catches your fancy? This land is very brawny. Yeah. How much the ones Platt and Eliza? Ah. Yes. A thousand for Platt. Uh, oh, this is a creature of considerable talent, I assure you. Seven hundred for Eliza, my fairest price. Mm. You would accept a note? Please, oh, of course, sir, from you, Mr. do not Ford. divide my family. Do not take me unless you take my children. Eliza, quiet! You will have the most faithful slave in me, the most Liza. faithful slave that's ever lived, but I beg that you Your do price not separate us. Your price for the boy. Please. Stop it. I will give you something God, to cry about. Please. Randall, come forward. Come, 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 come. Now, you see how fit this boy is, mm -hmm. like ripe fruit. May I take your stick a moment? Observe this, Randall. Jump, 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 run, run. Very good. Higher. You see this? Very likely. He will grow into a fine beast. So, how did you get from an interest in empire, colonialism, uh, slave labor, and come across the Atlantic to slavery in the United States? Well, I was, I wanted to make a movie about slavery. Um, I had an idea, an inn as such, of a free man in the North who gets kidnapped into slavery. Um, and that, with, we, through his journey through the maze, we, the audience, follow him, trying to get back home. Um, I was working with a writer at the time, George Midley, and wasn't having too much luck. Um, and then my wife said to me, why didn't you sort of look into true accounts of slavery? Sorry. Um, she found this book in, in both our research it's called 12 Years a Slave. And as soon as I had the book in my hand, it's kind of strange that sometimes you have an idea and it is formalized. It is there already, virtually as a, as a screenplay. And it's like, my goodness, this idea is there. Um, and that was it, really. Um, again, I had been looking in, 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 in the Americas and everywhere. But there was this story that for me resonated, possibly just because I live in Amsterdam, and it reminded me very much of Anne Frank's diary. It was, a, it was, a, it, and in fact, I found out it was it was it was, it was only only a, a first-hand account of someone who was into slavery, and uh, uh, you know survived and got out. Um, and again, I was mad at myself for not knowing the book, but then I realized that no one I knew knew the book. Do you think your perspective as a British artist? Gives you a different point of view on this subject than if you were Afro-American. No, I don't. You know, again, I, you know, again, I, I you know, it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, my, my background is, is, uh, you know, my parents are from the West Indies, my mother's from Grenada, my father's from Grenada, my mother was born in Trinidad. You know, Grenada is where Malcolm X's mother was born. Uh, Trinidad is where Stokely Carmichael was born, the guy who coined the phrase "Black Power." I mean, you could think of Colin Powell, you could think of Henry Bolafonte, Sidney Poitier. Marcus, I mean, this Marcus Garvey, there's this crossover. You can think of hip hop, you know, starting in Jamaica with Toast. I mean, there's, there's, it's not, it's about the diaspora. And um, I, 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 you know, it's, 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 the, uh, slavery isn't, isn't, was, is, was never an American uh, sort of own, own thing. It was a world own thing, it was industry. You know, it's the biggest industry in America, the longest industry in America ever had. I mean, it's interesting if you think about, again, first world problems, somebody like Brandon, mm -hmm. the slave economy in Africa that supports the technologies that he uses, mm -hmm. the social reality that he lives in that stems sure. from slavery in this country. And sure. I mean, I think there's an interesting network going on across your work that has some very unpleasant truths to tell. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, my, <coughs> me, me sitting here, I mean, someone's paying for it. Absolutely, and again, it's the same situation when you think of 12 Years a Slave in 1853 when, 
some of us was, was, you know, became free. I mean, you move, you fast forward to you know, 160 years later to, to, to today. I mean, you know, my clothes and stuff. Someone, you know, some sweatshop somewhere, you know, in the world. Someone is you know, enslaved. I mean, again, it, it, it's a different paradigm, different times, and how you know maybe that the movie will be made of them in 160 years' time. So it's it's where we are now, really. And how did you? And it's interesting. Thank you for that. that the connection to, to to Brandon as well, because again, it's it's to do with that those first world things you say problems are very current and, and very um, you know important as well as you know, twelve years a slave. There's no the hierarchy is not is not because one is suffering. I mean, you can suffer in, in in different in different ways. Of course, one is suffering more. There's no two ways about it. But it it is as you say connected. And then, Sorry. before we show one last clip, and then we can go into sure. questions from the audience, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, dealing with a primary text like Northrop's, as opposed to dealing with, I mean, the kinds of research you might have done about Bobby Sands, or the kinds of research you did interviewing sex addicts. Um, sure. I mean, this is a really important document that you've gotten into this guy's head. Yeah. Um, how did Shuatel work with you mm -hmm. to achieve this unbelievable performance? And mm -hmm. then in the scene that we'll show, I, th I think you see how all of these things in your work come together in this one scene, I think. But um, go oh, for it. Uh, well, the research never stops because we just found the book. Because it was, it was the well, for me. I'm very, I'm meticulous. I like detail. I'm a bit of a freak about detail. I mean, just again, you know, even when we were doing hunger, it was all about was it raining on that day? What kind of rain? You know, when when do you get used to the to the to the, to the, to the feces on the wall? What was it like in the summer when, when the blue bottles came? Because these questions were never asked to these guys. You know, when you read the history books, it's about this happened on that day, it happened on that day, and then this happened, this happened, this day. It's never about the details. What was it like? What was this, you know, what the details and the, the, the taste, the smell, the, 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 did those things actually make history, the details again? So I was, again, as we did on, on, on 12 Years a Slave, I mean, the right, you know, again, the amount of research and, you know, it, it becomes so, uh, and again, with, with Henry Gates Lewis Jr., who was a wonderful person to sort of reference down then, but you know, we went to talk about the details of the shackles, where the people came from, so forth, what plantations, what were they planted or not, that plantation. Um, you know, just, I mean, the clothes, I mean, some of the clothes in the movie are actually real, uh, this clothes are, are real slave clothes. We had a wonderful woman called Patty Norris, who was a, a genius costume designer, and we had, uh, you know, um, Excuse me. Um, um, obviously, Sean Bobbitt was 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 was, was particular. I'm just trying to remember my cost, my my art director, um, Adam Stockhausen, my art director was just. Uh, I mean, you know, so they, that combination of people and detail and also uh, accuracy was very important. Accuracy, as much as I could, of course. Okay, so we'll show a clip where I think. True, tell I'll get later. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, again, I think this brings together this interest in the haptic in. The political subject in duration. Mm -hmm. um, let's show the clip, please. Solomon, can I interest you in a new cravat? Pure silk by way of the French. We're in need of a fresh carry off in my missus's travels, nothing more. The year has passed already. Off to work at Sandy Hill again. I am. I have just the thing something to suit your style and yet sturdy enough for the 40 mile round trip. It's beautiful. At what price? We will take it. Children, come see what your father has just purchased for me. Oh, one moment, sir, and you'll be assisted. Mr. Parker. Sir, we can discuss the price. Oh, forgive me, Solomon. Forgive me, Mrs. Northup. The customer waits. Welcome, sir. Shop well, sir, but mind your wallet. Pay no attention to this gentleman's nonsense. Jasper! My regrets for the intrusion, sir. No intrusion. Good day, sir. Good day. Yes. Okay, so maybe if you want to just say one word about Chiwetel, and then I think we'll open yeah. it up. Um, we started to, I mean, I started talking to him about Valentino and Buster Keaton, um, because it was all about the face. It was always about the eyes. I, I mean, I was very on him about, you know, eyes, because most of the time he doesn't say much. Solomon, um, and he can't say much, obviously, he can't reveal who he, who he really is. Um, so it's a case of the audience, and that, that, that direct relation with the audience, 
I mean, you know, when you're talking to someone, you often know when they're lying because we, we read faces. It's the same thing as I was speaking about as far as the dark is concerned, or, you know, things which are cast in darkness. You often you read it, but you see somebody and you, you can read in between the lines. We all can. I think with, with Solomon, it was very important that he had, uh, his face was sensitive to the moment. And we just kept on talking. I kept on showing him, you know, again, Valentino and Keaton and how they, the, that, that connection. It was, it was a lot. I mean, at first it was like it was drumming home, drumming at home all the time. And all, after what he, he got it. And that, that, that translates to an audience. I mean, you know, th th there was some kind of a conversation very early on, which wasn't a conversation at all about voiceover. He really got to understand what's in his head. No, we have to feel and have to understand it because we, as an audience, I trust the audience to sort of recognize what's, what, what, what's going on. With, with, with Solomon, that's what we spoke about, and that, that was amazing. I mean, again, we, we get the, 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 if you've seen the movie, there's a shot at the end where there's this long sort of um, hell shot on, on Solomon. And he's obviously, he, he's older, and he's been sort of on the plantation for obviously a while. And, you know, just holding the camera on his face and seeing him do what he did. I mean, you know, tell me an actor that could hold the screen for a minute and a half and do nothing, and it'd be absolutely captivating. By that time, he, you know, he was, he was you know, an, an athlete in that. It's a great film. Congratulations. Thank you. OK, let's take audience questions, please. And as well, you heard see. previously, if you could just wait for the mic and speak carefully into it. Just one over there. The scene when Solomon starts singing with the other slaves. Mm -hmm. um, that scene again. It was it was it was, a, it was a Alan Lomax recording of a old uh, slave spiritual. Um, and um, what was interesting for me, and and again it relates to what we just talked about as far as Solomon's um, face, um, is. Um, at that point in the film, he's at his lowest ebb. You know, um, you know his letters have been found. Um, the, the letter he's been trying to write for years. Um, he, he's, he, he's been nearly caught um, because someone has betrayed him. He's at this lowest, lowest, lowest ebb of him thinking he will ever see his family again. And he's at this, if, if some people haven't seen the film, he, he's, he's at a funeral. Of one of, of one of the slaves who, have, who was just collapsed in the field after being worked, you know, forever, and through the song, you know, he, what Jutal um, does, and he, is from the lowest ebb, he goes to the most, well, the highest spiritual sort of um, exuberance one c could could feel in one shot, um, and it's just. You know that he becomes one of them. He's a member. He is. He is one of. He becomes uh, one of the community. Then he accepts in somehow, and through that acceptance, and through that sort of understanding of hope, he, you know, touches something in him very deep inside. And it was just a. Yeah, it was. A, yeah, it was. Yeah, it is what it is. That's the description of it, and um, hope it is translated. Here and then. Yes, hi. I have um, a two part question. My first one is um, well, first, I'll just say that the movie had quite an impact on me, and it's uh, brought about a lot of discussions with my friends. And I guess I assumed we, within the African American community that um, most people would be like myself and would want to go out and see it right away. And I found that there's a few circles that have said, um, that they won't see the, you know, that they're not going to see the movie, they don't want to see it, and um, feel as though there should be focus on other types of things other than slavery, such as Black Wall Street, as an example of one of the discussions I participated in. So my first question is, what are your thoughts on that, and whose responsibility are those types of stories to bring to film? And then my second question... Well, I understand that. What, whose, whose responsibility is it what? To bring to life these types of other stories about um, African Americans because they're the the context of the conversations that have been taking place have been you know like understood yes uh -huh. don't go see it because the next part of the what question, about these? sorry this then the is, second uh, question uh, is just um there was also a comment about the scene with um, um, with um, Northup 
and uh, when Sally was being beaten towards the end, mm -hmm. and the comment was that it was to punish him versus Sally. Was that an Patsy? incorrect? No, punish him, no, no. Anyway, yeah. I'll answer the first part of the question. Look, I, you know, someone asked me a question the other day, was when was the first time um, someone, when was the first time I came in contact with slavery? And to be honest, well, it, was, it shocked me, that question, because I couldn't, I was like, I don't, it was, it was like asking someone, it was like, it was like asking me, or asking you, when was the first time you, you, you learned your name? It was a very strange thing. Um, thank you for putting me up on the mic. Um, and it was very strange in the way that, um, it, you know, as a child, as, as, a, as, a, as a child, to have that start in life, where you understand the idea, you have an, you have an idea of slavery, or you're, you, you're, you, you, you have that early idea of slavery, it's very, it does a very strange thing. It actually puts you in a situation where you ask yourself a question about your society you're in and where you are in that society at a very early age. So one can see that as a disadvantage or, or an advantage. All I remember as a young person, I felt a tremendous sense of shame and embarrassment of, of finding that out. So for me, this film was all about taming that, mastering it. In order to sort of you know, go forward, one has to go backwards and, 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 and embrace that in order to move on, just like other you know, groups have done within their unfortunate past. You know, it's, it's, it's a must. And to sort of put a blinker on it didn't happen, hasn't happened, is to sort of you know, walk around somehow in, 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 with, 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 a way, with, with a limp. I want to walk straight. I don't want to be afraid or fear anything. I want to look at something and embrace it, and okay, and master it. That's what. That's why I wanted to make the film. Um, the whole idea, anyway. The second half of that question was all about Patsy. No, 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 no. I, you know, poor Mr. Epps, poor Mr. Epps. No, not at all. But what Epps is? It. What's interesting about Epps and why I have a sympathy for him in a way. He's he's, he's a racist. He's he's a plantation uh, owner. Uh, owner. You know, he's he's he's, he's, a, he's a monster to some extent, but he's a human being. So there's a, for me there's sympathy because he doesn't understand that he, you know, he's in love with Patsy. He's in love with her. But he doesn't understand, how am I, a plantation owner, in love with this slave? How is that possible? And you know, this is Patsy who goes off to see Mrs. Epps every, uh, sorry, Mrs. Shaw every Sunday, who is openly, uh, who, who Miss, Miss, Mrs. Shaw is openly uh, married, this, 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 this black woman. You know, she's the mistress of the house. So Epps is jealous that she goes there every Sunday, and he's thinking possibly Shaw is having a thing with her. I mean, obviously not, it's just jealousy. But he's just obviously assured as well that he's having an open relationship, marriage with a black woman. So he, you know, for me, he takes out, he tries to destroy his love for Patsy by destroying her. You know, that's what it is. You know, Patsy is, 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 the, is the victim here for sure. No, so that's that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, for coming in for the great dialogue. Um, it's rare you come across a piece of art that is that challenges you to be to ask yourself what kind of person you are. And that's twelve years was that kind of work. Um, and I had some insight that it was maybe it was like um, you know in European history uh, when painting first came along, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years ago how when people first saw paintings, uh, it was a revolution because they actually saw for the first time something they'd only, they'd only heard about with words and language. And it's in this kind of, this kind of story, you can feel it, it comes to life uh, in slavery. And, and uh, you know, following along that line, um, you're, there seems to be, so you have such a strong sense of uh, morality, ethics, and a, a, a strong spiritual sort of rudder in your work, could you speak about where that comes from and what, what guides, guides your, your true, true direction? Just, I mean, I, I think just being human. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that, being a human being and, you know, f you know thinking of uh, as you as me. And, and hopefully you thinking of, 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 of me as you. That's all. It's, it's just, it's respect. That's it, it's, it's very simple. You know, it's not, uh, I wish I could say, give you a better, clever answer, but it's just very simple, you know. Go ahead. Hi. 
Hello. I'm so excited. I love your shoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You notice. You don't know what you mean. <laughs> As an artist, you don't know what you mean to me. I was at the barber shop getting ready to come here, and um, before and earlier today, and we were all in the barber shop, and we were all talking, and uh, Denzel Washington was on screen on one of his many movies, and. You came up, and uh, you know, it's four guys who own this barber shop, and they all have kids. And I didn't mention that I was coming here tonight, but um, we all started talking about it, and we were really excited. And um, having that moment of why is Quentin Tarantino our critical race theorist, and um, why does everybody want to see um, his other film? Why aren't we talking about this film? And um, and one of the things I said, I was like, well, it's uncomfortable. Americans, white people are really uncomfortable. And when I'm in the presence of your work, I'm relieved and I feel good and I feel seen. And I don't have to work really, really hard to have that language to go around white people so they feel comfortable. Well, not just how white people, trust this? me. We just had examples of black people. Yeah, white, this, I mean, is, this I mean. is how I've internalized white supremacy also. I have to say, well, I want to see Black Wall Street. And it's that internalization. How do you do this? How do you move through these spaces? Because the guys at the barbershop, I have to go back and talk to them about this. How, how do you negotiate your language and move through these spaces and talk about your work like this? Just do it. It's, it's simple. Just do it. I mean, there's no, there's no big Einstein idea. I mean, you know, come on, just be true to yourself. Just do it. I mean, you know, why do you? Too much thinking. Just, just do it. It's just, you know, I mean, it's no, and it's, I don't mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the truth. You know, no, it's, it's just do it. I mean, it's, you know, it's the truth. I mean, it's and naked. It's, 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 it's there. I mean, you know, it's very simple. I wish I was more. Da 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 da. da. No. <laughs> Steve, I'd just like to ask you, but the relationship between art and film, where audience comes in in terms of the scale, because you're saying 1,100 cinemas, it's clearly at a scale that people are able to discuss in the barber shops, at a level that isn't necessarily going to happen in a museum context. And finance and how films are funded is obviously very different to art, how art projects are funded. If it were possible that you had the same budget but it was going to be an artwork, how would that influence, would it influence the work or your decision to make it more as an artwork or a film work? Well, that hypothesis, I can't really question, I can't really give you an answer there. I don't have an answer <coughs> that costs six, uh, $20 million in my head, in my head. Um, possibly one day. But I mean, you know, the, um, the whole idea of art and film, again, it's again, it's like, you know, who reads poetry? Hardly anyone reads poetry, but you know, for me, art is poetry, and it's the, it's the fraction, it's the it's the it's, it's the fracturing, it's the sort of uh, the the the, um, uh, the compressing of language, using the same words as you would with a yarn, you know, with the decompressing the, the story. So you know, for me, art is in some ways poetry, and, and film is, is 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 the novel as such. You know, it's like again, it's one is sort of you know, it's like you know, Beckett and 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 and, and Joyce, in a way. I wanted to ask a question about your film, Hunger. Um, when Bobby Sands in your script talks about that sense of personal freedom, and then we reflect on that unbending voice of Margaret Thatcher speaking in an unrelenting, kind of a, a separate reality. Today in Britain, what's come forward from 1981 is a, an electronic surveillance society and uh, the people who are in trial right now for breaking into people's cell phones. And the issue of data privacy in, the, in America is um, a growing concern. I'm, I'm just wondering if you would comment about that conflict of freedom and the camera and surveillance. Wow, I mean, I think what happened in Britain was that the reason we got, we got more, more cameras anywhere in the world, I think, it was to do with you know, IRA bombing, bombing London. And that's when they started to put up a lot of cameras. Uh, that was in the uh, 80s, early 80s, they started putting up a lot, a lot of cameras. And, you know, it was a, I, mean, I think it was, a, again, it became a great excuse to put up a lot, put up a lot of cameras to spy on us. Um, as far as, you know, again, I, the commenting on, 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 on surveillance, and, you know, it's a strange thing. It's, it's one of those things where, um, 
you know, we all know we're being uh, sp spied upon, phone calls and, you know, tracked and with our computers and so forth and phones and, and, what, and, and whatever, but what can we do about it? It's very odd, isn't it? It's your, it's all, we're all in war. You know, it's like, I love that, that Bob Marley song. He goes, one day I woke up a prisoner. Oh, Lord, I'm a, I am a... Well, one day I woke up in a curfew. Oh, Lord, I am a prisoner too. You know, it's kind of, what can we do about it? I don't know. I don't know, you know. They start throwing up phones and computers in the bin. I don't know. Could you talk a little bit about the Paul Robeson piece? Paul Robeson, oh, God. Oh. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, again, apologize. Um, well, Paul Ropes and we, I don't know anyone who knows here, Paul, Paul, Paul Ropes and anyone. Most people do, right? No, it's amazing. And Paul, uh, you know, was was he was he, he was he was under surveillance since again he's a, he died in seventy eight, and he was in under surveillance since 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 the thirties. you know, it's, it's, it's CIA. Uh, excuse me, he's not CIA, FBI, FBI. excuse me, um, um, uh, was basically trailing him, tapping his phone, uh, letters, correspondence, you know, for, you know, uh, what, for, was it 50, 50 years, was it 40 years? Uh, crazy. And I did, I, and I was, it was, he was just, he was just an interesting guy to me. I mean, again, I don't want to go, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm quite tired right now. And I, I, it, what, 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 he was just one of those guys who was just an amazing man. Uh, you know, and you have to find out a lot about him if, if, if you don't. Anyway, he was under surveillance for a certain, certain amount of time. And um, I did this piece where I got all these FBI files and I did a thing called, it's called End Credits, where I slowly sort of, um, uh, sort of, almost like end credits sort of went down uh, with, with these pay pieces of paper and you saw what we, how he was, sort of what was hap what, what these surveillance was. And I've got these people to do voiceovers and, 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 read, and read all the files. It was, just, it, just, it was just immense, that weight. Sorry, I wish I hadn't asked me that question now because I'm, I, I apologize, but you've got to know who Paul Robeson, if you don't know who Paul Robeson is, please find out. Okay, very important man. Just gentleman down here and then in the center. Uh, what advice, uh, if you could travel back in time, what advice would you give to the kid with the uh, eight millimeter Bolex? That you said you used yes. earlier when you first started out? It's a great camera. And if any at all. Um, I was lucky. I was very lucky growing up in Britain at that time. You know, I, I went to university, you know, I, I did my masters and they dropped out <laughs> in, in my, you know, I, you know I, I, had, I was at a time when I had free education. I was at a time when I could go to, to, to school and do what I wanted to do and not think. You know, I was very lucky. I grew up, I was, I was living in the inner city and then my mother, we moved to the suburbs and the place called Ealing, which is the one, it was called the queen of the suburbs. We had huge, we had parks. You know, I could go out all, the, all summer, you know, with my friends and lie in the park and, you know, play and stuff. And uh, I wasn't running around sort of housing estates and stuff and, you know, doing, you know, stealing things. I was in the park. It's an environment. I was very lucky. And I was very lucky at that time that there was a system which was free education. You could go to university for three. You could go do a master's for free. You know, I was very fortunate. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't happen in, in Britain. And education is not free anymore, which is a crime, a, an absolute crime. So, you know, that, that's the only reason why I'm sitting here now, because I was very fortunate. That's it. It could have, it could have easily have happened differently. Uh, what advice would I give? Well, that was it. I was just lucky. I have a very simple question about a very specific passage in uh, 12 Years a Slave. I hate this guy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> what did Jasper want to say to Solomon? The scene where they're in the store and he's buying the bag for his wife to go away. Yes. Remember, she's going to go away yes, and cook. Yes. And Jasper yes. comes in and you give it, he, because suddenly yes. we have a point of view shot from Jasper's <coughs> point of view. Yes. And he sees them. And then he goes in the store, but yes. he's been not able to speak before the guy comes in. Yes. What was that exchange? Well, it was interesting in the book, if I can remember correctly, and someone maybe but it recently could, 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 could <coughs> uh, correct me. Um, he, he, he spoke, sometimes Solomon spoke to slaves, uh, uh, slaves, uh, slaves who had masks, sometimes and he was in the shop, and they would speak to Solomon about what it is to be free. And you know, he, how, slaves would talk to him about the, how them wanting to be free too. And what did he do? And he's about his family. He would have often have conversations with with with, with slaves who, who had masters. And it was a case that that was one of those one of those one of those conversations. Well, well he, that's what he would say to him. You know, I want to be free, and what it is to be free and stuff. And 
<coughs> and whatnot. A lot of them, a lot of them at a certain time, I think it was, uh, what was it, after 1850, 1850 something, if, 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 for example, as soon as you got into the north and you were a slave, you could, you could just you could split from your master and you'll be, you'll be free. So that, that's when they stopped bringing up s slaves from the south. At a certain time in the 1850, they stopped bringing slaves up to the south because, you know, at that time, they, they, slavery was, was, was not obviously allowed in the north, and you could actually split and be free. So that, 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 that was a conversation. But I didn't obviously let that happen. Okay, we probably have time for maybe two more questions. Steve's done two of these already today. It's so. okay. <laughs> one, one. I'm I'm curious about mm -hmm. your relationship and how you work with Michael Fassbender, yes. because it seems to me that his work in your films he goes so much deeper and he seems to be more interested in exploring all sides of a character, even unlovable sides, and I've seen him in other films, and I never get that sense. I haven't seen that, that deepness, and, it, and it's, you've worked with him in three different films, and so I'm just sort of curious about your relationship with him. Well, I, I met Michael in an audition for Hunger, and when I first met him, I thought he was, I mean, full of shit. I thought he was really kind of um, cocky, oh, he's cocky bastard. <laughs> and um, what happened was that the cast and director said, okay, well, listen, we'll bring him back with some other people back. I said, yeah, okay, we, we bring him back, but bring some others too. And on, on his second in, uh, audition, he was amazing. You know, there was a kind of, again, I think with, at that time, I was a bit naive <clears throat> as a director, not knowing that in the auditions, how much the actors bring into an audition, how much they hold back, because they don't know how much, you know, it's almost like what they, it's, it's a very strange sort of, uh, odd thing an, an audition and when I met Michael for the second time that, that was it and uh, we, we you know he at that time he told me a story when we were in the audition that you know recently he had gone rock climbing and he I was climbing and he he he, he, nearly, he nearly fell he nearly he died doing his rock climbing in, in, in Ireland and he thought to himself well you know I don't want to piss my talent up the wall because I think at that time you know Michael was 20 30 30 at that time I mean he should have been discovered before but he, you know, he was having his own, doing his own things, you know? And I think I, I caught him and he caught me at the right time and that was it. And there was that commitment. There was that thing of trust. And I think when we went through hunger, when he was on the, when he was on the, 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 uh, the losing weight regime, you know, there was moments of, of real vulnerability. There were moments of, you know, you know, what to hold him, you know? And I think through that sort of, we went in deep, through that deep, sort of um, start, that, that was it, that was, it was, it was, uh, that was a starting point, yeah. I, um, I'm interested in um, some of the audience reactions that you've heard mm -hmm. about 12 years, because um, you talked a minute ago about the slaves being able to leave the South and go into the North and then be free of their masters and that kind of geographical move is something that, um, I guess, put them in a safer space. But when I look at the condition of um, black bodies in the world, especially here in the United States, that safe space, you know, there are still spaces that we can't occupy and expect to have security of body in. Have people talked about the parallel between the way people who look like me are treated now versus then, because the entire time I was watching the movie, I was like, these things still happen today. For sure, <laughs> for sure. I mean, <clears throat> that's the reason to, that's, you know, again, the, the, the parallel to sort of even at the, towards the end of the movie when, you know, Solomon doesn't get justice. Uh, or, or, or all to do with, you know, I always, when I see that scene, it's always sort of, it's, it makes me, I shouldn't say laugh, but it just, it just, you know, I just, you know, it's when, you know, when Solomon is, uh, you know, sort of says, uh, uh, my papers. You know, the, the, when the guy goes, um, show me your papers. And I always feel, of, we, you have a thing here, was it stop and search here? And then, you know, and we have the same thing in, 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 in Frisk and something, we had a stop and search, and like, show me your papers. It's like, you know, it's a very, you know, there's so much, so many, so many similarities to now um, uh, of um, abuse. And it was just, you know, at the, you know, at the time of making it, I mean, look, we've been made this movie uh, in this year, Trevor Martin, killed, 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery, 50th anniversary of the, the, the March on Washington, 
the voting rights were re revoked, one has to ask himself, you know, where we've come and where we're going, you know. And again, I'm not an American, I'm, 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 I'm English, I'm, but at the same time, it reflects in England too, and Britain and Europe too, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's crazy. And again, when I was looking, when I read that Twelve Years Slave for the first time, for me it was a, it was, it was like I was reading, it was like it was, I just, I thought, oh, this is like, it's like science fiction, but it actually happened, and it's happening. So yeah, you know. Again, we have to move forward, but it, at the same time, we have to not forget our past in order to move forward. That's how it is. And those films about Wall Street and those films, those romantic comedies, they will be made for sure. <laughs> I have a question, actually, too, about editing. One has, to, I'm over here. Hi. Hi, sorry, apologize. Sorry. Um, one has to do with translating the book, the memoir, into a cinema. And you said somebody handed me the book and it was a script. But wife, yeah. obviously, your vision is embedded in the cinema. Mm -hmm. Did you change the point of view? Were there lots of scenes that you took out yes. or added? And then similarly, after you shot it, were there a lot of things that ended up on the editing room floor that might be interesting for us to hear because it talks about your vision as a filmmaker using the yeah. story that someone else lived through and wrote as a point of departure, but uh, understanding your vision mm -hmm. as an artist? Well, yeah, I'm not an illustrator, I'm a filmmaker. And um, I'm sorry, I'm not an illustrator, I'm, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. So it's just, there was a constant process of making. I mean, we shot this movie in 35 days with, with one camera. So yeah, people do this, people say all that. But I'm so ignorant, I don't know. I'm, I'm fast apparently. Um, so I'm like, oh shit, I should ask for more money and stuff. Um, yeah, I, yeah, apparently I, that, that's impressive. But I'm, when you come from London, you have no money, you just get on with it. Um, so that's, that they, got, they got more their money's worth, anyway. Um, so it's, it's, it's a constant, constant sort of, you know, again, you, you, you write the script, you get the script, and then you sort of you know, edit the script. Even on, on set, you sort of, you, you, you tinker with it, you cut, you, you go back. There's one scene in the movie, there's a couple of scenes, but one scene in the movie, that I, I, important one, I, I dropped, which I had to drop, uh, which it didn't, it didn't work. It, it, it didn't work. Um, which is a, a little bit of a regret, um, but it's one of those things where it, it just wasn't working for the f for the film. Uh, yes, I will. Yes, it's 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 it's, a, it's actually uh, again. What's so wonderful about this film is, in fact, you know, Twelve Years a Slave is it's a kind of a feminist movie in a way. The most important characters in the movie are all women, and there was one other woman who was in the film. But it was Celeste. Celeste was a runaway slave who lived in the swamp, who Solomon sort of uh, meets. One day when he's out, you know, he's, he, and he has a solitude moment and plays his violin. And it was such a beautiful scene, but it just wasn't, it didn't fit into the movie. It's the first time actually, I'm actually saying this actually, I've never said, spoke about this before. But it just wasn't fitting in the, in, in, into the movie. It was too, it was too many, it's almost like, you know, as you know, there's a lot of characters in the film. It was just one extra. It was the way, it was just, but, but it was the way, you know, it, was, it needed to be like this, and to, to, do, to get it up, to get it up like this, that needed to be, that needed to be lost. Um, so that that was a scene that was that was that, that was taken from the from within the editing process. But also, you know, even the beginning, the beginning, beginning of the film wasn't like that. You know, that was through the editing. That was through the the, the, the sort of uh, the balance as such. You know, the, the scene where we get the guys lined up and say, you know, um, you know, you, you know, you are all you. You know, da da da. That that was because I was doing this sort of um, I was editing this. Um, this sort of montage of um, <laughs> of this of of Judge of uh, of um, Judge Turner, and I wanted to have a reprieve. And I thought, oh my God, that would be amazing in the front of the film as a to put the jump, make the audience jump into the deep end, you know, throw them into hold all of slavery rather than it be an A B C D. So you know that you know it's very okay. I, you know, you're waiting until this guy gets caught and put into slavery, but you throw them into the deep end, and it was just interesting. And you're, you're an editor, aren't you? You're not an editor, but you're a very good question. Anyway, just, it was just interesting in how you, you know, make that, you know, the, 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 the construction of, of the tale. And again, going on a bit, one last thing, was it reminded me of, of, of the Brothers Grimm. It reminded me of, of children's stories, the whole book. Because you got, you, 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 you've got sort of um, uh, uh, Solomon and, uh, no, excuse me, you've got um, Hamilton Brown seducing Solomon into the, into the circus. It's, it's Pinocchio, you know? And then you've got the whole construction of it. It's like, it's like the darkest, 
fairy tale you can think of, and then it's happy ever after at the end. I mean, that's the best children's stories. I mean, they, you know, the Brothers Grimm, you know, Hansel and Gretel and so forth, yeah. Why was it important for you to end with the circumstances of his death? <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, I was, there was under pressure for me not to put that in. <laughs> but it's sad, but it's true. It's sad, but it's true. I mean, you know, <clears throat> you know, can you say that you found me, you know, I mean, you know, I said to them, you know, I just said, you know, I said, look, you know, look, I mean, look at Anne Frank. I mean, you know, you know, when you read that book and then you, in the last page, you shut the book and, you know, you find out that she was, you know, taken to sort of, uh, to outfits, and, you know, and, you know, possibly starved and gassed. That, that was the end of her. You know, it sort of makes you think, doesn't it? That, you know, you know, I mean, Solomon, you know, you know, like many of many black people, you know, we, you know, where they're buried or where they come from, where, where it happened to them, we don't know, we don't know. And Solomon was one of them. I think that's a, a, extraordinarily powerful that, you know, we don't know when he died or how he died or where, I mean, this is the guy who actually was actively working on the Underground Railroad. So one could well imagine how he died. I'll tell you a funny story, not even a funny one, I'll tell you a true story. <laughs> So unfortunately, one, you know, my dad died about seven years ago. But one of the last things he told me some story, he, um, and this is my American sort of story as such. He was working um, in Florida in the late 50s, early 60s. I mean, they used to get people from the West Indies to pick oranges, you know? So they used to get these uh, migrant workers, immigrant workers to, to go out and, and they went in these camps to pick oranges in the South. So what happened one day is my dad had these two Jamaican friends. <laughs> and they snuck, said, come on, let's go sneak out, let's go and get a, a drink. Let's go and get, you know, let's go have a drink. So they snuck out. And they went into some town in, in, in Florida. They went in some bar. These two Jamaican guys were walking up with my dad, walked up to the bar. And the guy stood up. So, so, so it was like, it's, my dad said it was, it, was, it was like a Western people. The doors opened and everyone was like. <laughs> And, uh, and I walked up, one of the, one of the guys, Jamaican guys, walked up to the bar. I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, can, I get, uh, can I get a drink, please? And the guy comes up, goes up to him and goes, we don't serve niggers. So the Jamaican guy goes, you don't serve niggers? Then we'll serve ourselves. Took a bottle and boom, <laughs> <laughs> on his head. And they ran out. They ran out, they ran, they ran, ran, ran out. And one of them got killed and shot and, and died. And my dad had to hide in a ditch with the other guy, hide in a ditch. And somehow that night, sort of, they made their way back to the camp. I mean, you know, this was, what, late 60s? Oh, sorry, no, sorry, excuse me, early 60s, late, late 50s? So, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, that guy, I don't know, what happened to him, I don't know. Should we end now? <laughs> or maybe one up, go on, let's go up, let's say so. Okay. Steve, it's not up. You don't have to look too far this time. Um, I just want to comment, I think, on the timeliness of your movie. I, I, I think that there is some misperceptions in America. We have a black president. There's no more racism in America. I mean, right? There's no more racism. No, of course there is. And I think it's the awareness is coming about, and we've now had, in the last year, really almost three movies that deal with the topic of slavery. It was touched upon in Lincoln. It was pushed upon in Django Unchained, but there was that humor aspect of it. And then I think your movie is putting your foot on the pedal and pushing it down and keeping it there the whole movie. And, and I think it, it is just probably among the most powerful movies I've ever seen in my life. And if Americans don't realize that we still have racism in America, we're idiots. And we are. I, I don't know how to, if there's a question. No, there. unless a statement, let's go with that. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, good, good.